fact, we every, every um, bef- the night before every show, uh, Rob sends out a, a text message, and it lists you know who the guests are going to be. And for the first time, we were listed as Bill and Gill, which <laughs> Bill I thought and was, Gill. You know, <laughs> it sounds like a comedy team. I thought to myself, they know who they are. I don't need to write out Bill Stubblefield, retired admiral and former president of the Berkeley County Commission, New York Times bestselling author John Gill. They know who they are. They're comfortable in their own skin now. So now you're just Bill and Gill to me. All right. Just Bill and Gil. I, you know, I think when I get first blood, yeah, I know. You know, I'm just going to say that. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. B's it's only because of alphabetical order. <laughs> That's exactly it's, right. It, but we take what we can get, John. <laughs> Next week it'll be Gil and Bill, I guess. I don't know. Uh, via telephone, financial Phil Phil McCoy from Ameriprise Financial and the Myriad Group of Financial Advisors on Winchester Avenue. Morning, Philly. Good morning, guys. How are you all? I'm kind of hungry, John. How are you? I'm doing all right. How about Bill? Hey. Uh, you, you mentioned food, yeah. yeah. Now use a little food here, Phil. <laughs> All the candy. Well, I'm supposed to be bringing something in. <laughs> to have breakfast for these guys. Well, maybe next week. We're deserving. We're deserving, Phil. Phil, at least some donuts. Yeah. Berkshire Hathaway posted a 40 percent jump in operating earnings and now has 157 billion in cash. Berkshire Hathaway. That's a lot of cash. It is a lot of cash. We're talking nearly Stubblefield kind of money there when you're talking about <laughs> that much in cash. You used to see Bill's pockets when he walks in the room, man. I'm telling you. It looks I like- just like walking behind him because they fall out. All those, <laughs> those bills. I can pick them up as they go along. Hansel and Gretel and the breadcrumbs there. Come on, Phil. You can jump in any time. So we know Bill's Give in the room. Protection. I can't help. I can't help. I can't speak to that. A sea, a sea of C notes trailing behind him where, where he walks. Uh, Phil, we had a great week last week with the Marcus. Uh, one of the best uh, weeks uh, ever. Uh, what was the story behind that success? Well, it was the best week since October and November of last year, so certainly the best week that we have had this year. But in this recent bull run, even with the way August, September, and October was, once we go back to October of last year, we have been on quite the run. And it, it, it was carried through last week. We recovered some of what we lost. But, man, we, to go in three or four days and be up, Six uh, percent, over six percent on the Nasdaq, over five percent on on the S and P. It was a really good week, and then there were three three things, three days, uh, and Friday really big, being the biggest part of that. But one was the Federal Reserve last week, when especially when he spoke, they re, they kept rates the same, which wasn't a surprise to anyone. I think anyone paying attention knew that. And when I listened to it, you know, I tried to I tried to determine personally without any outside noise. What do I take from this? And I've always thought that Jerome Powell was really good without tipping his hand other than in August of 2022, and he said we need to experience some pain, and our markets fell because of that. And then there was, I think it was August of this year, where he reiterated something that John and I had uh, both agree upon, uh, and we've talked, discussed multiple times, why does the target have to be 2%? Couldn't it be 2.5%? He reiterated in August of this year, that that target is 2%, and they're not coming off of it. Almost to say, uh, John and Phil, shut up. I'm not coming off of that target. And that kind of led into those bad few months. But in this speech, I really couldn't find anything. I couldn't find anything that would say, hey, that's really positive news or really negative news. The only the only piece I'd say, well, we could we could take this and run with it to, to the downside, was that he said, we haven't even discussed cutting interest rates yet and that's what the market's looking for is when are we going to start cutting rates and he when he said we haven't even discussed that we're nowhere near that i thought to myself oh boy it's going to be another bad month until they speak again but it wasn't i was wrong and then friday the friday jobs report uh was cooler than what was expected you know we added 150,000 jobs and we expected much more than that and the unemployment rate ticked up to 3.9 percent. And this is a point of contention that really nobody likes to hear. But we do need to see softening in the jobs market to help uh, for help with inflation continue down to that 2 percent target. And we saw a really strong sign of that last Friday. Wages also kind of leveled out. And, and that's a, that's another huge part of it as well. So those two things uh, together plus – and this was kind of a surprise to me when I read it because I, I knew early on it was looking this way uh, it, through earnings season, what I'm talking about. I knew it was looking this way early on, but I thought that had taken a, taken a uh, step back. But 404 of the S&P 500 companies have reported. 
81% have exceeded expectations. So right now we're in this environment where, hey, hey, companies are still making money and doing better than expected, and our jobs uh, growth is slowing, and inflation is coming down. And that's kind of the perfect scenario that we need for inflation to come down and for the stock market to still do well. And last week was a really, really good week. We're uh, green, I think, so far today, but slightly so. And there's not a whole lot that's going to come out this week that we know of as far as earnings. I know Disney reports that Disney isn't going to send any indice drastically higher or lower based off what they report. There's earnings that come out, but nothing major. There's no Amazons or Apples or NVIDIA or anything like that that's going to report this week. And the the economic data is fairly light, so hopefully we can continue this run that we started last week. And it, and it looks reminiscent, even though a little bit late, of what the start of October of 2022 looked like. Phil, I was listening to an analyst uh, this morning in the 5 o'clock hour, and he was talking about Jerome Powell and the Fed's approach to inflation rates and was mentioning that the real inflation rate right now is actually already under 2%. And he felt that the Fed should have stopped hiking interest rates a couple of turns ago and that they are being overly cautious to the point where they're being detrimental to the <clears throat> to the economy and, and i agree with that too by the way I, I think powell screwed this up so badly in the beginning that he's been overcompensating uh, at the back end of it because of how badly he screwed this whole thing up to start with well i mean potentially and when you talk about screwing it up i don't know if you're if you're referring to the, the COVID rate cuts back in April of 2020 in our market sort, or the the entire transitory position that they that one they, there, they, that's they, the one yeah. I'm talking about. The, in the in the transitory, and you know I've been an apologist for the Federal Reserve all along, and I still maintain that. If we go back and look at that environment, I kind of see why, because they were flying blind. They were flying blind in in, in lieu of increasing rates. Because of how CPI and PPI is measured, it's measured based off the same time the previous year and the same time the previous year in April, May, June, July of 2021 when the transitory talk started, we were comparing it to when our economy was completely shutting down. So, of course, inflation was much, much higher in 2021 than what it was in 2020. But their stance was, but is this because of what we're comparing it against? Or is this or is this factual? Turns out that it was factual. And then when they wanted to start to increase, so yes, I, I agree with you that they missed it. But I understand why they missed it. And then when they wanted to start increasing rates at a at a faster clip, on came Omicron. If we remember that in December, in, in January of 2021. So they said, well, how can we do this if we may have to start sending people home? Again, we can't cut rates right in the face of that. That will cripple our economy. And, okay, now that, that we, we see the Omicron isn't going to have the impact that we feared, so now let's do it. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. So there was always something to stall. So all they were left with was those huge rate increases of, of uh, three-quarters of a percent. I also maintain that from the Federal Reserve standpoint, it is easier to repair if they over-tighten than if they under-tighten. And there is precedent from that. Back in when I was just a little baby boy in the 70s and early 80s, there's a precedent for that. And I don't know if it's comparable, but the in the early, in the late mid-late 70s, where they backed off of, of tightening and then inflation came back even stronger. And I, I heard someone, this wasn't my analogy, so I'm stealing it, but I, am, I do like using analogies. If you've ever had a cough and taken an antibiotic, but you didn't finish the round of it because you thought it was done, and then that cough comes back three times stronger than you ever had it before, and that's what they they were fearful of. So the the fear from the Federal Reserve is there's more harm could be done if we if we're too loose than if we tighten too much because we know look back at all, look back at April 2020, we know that is, if the rates are high. We can always cut those, and the reaction from that and the results from that are quicker than if we're increasing rates. So I think – I wouldn't disagree that, yes, they, they were wrong back in the transitory time. 100 percent they were wrong, which led to uh, huge increases. But at the same time, it's easier to back off of that than it is to repair that. Michael Jenny has a suggested name for this segment, by the way, Bill, Gill, and Phil. 
Hey, there you go. <laughs> Who's been left out on that, Rob? I can't think of anybody. Can you? <laughs> hey, and it's my, Rob. It's my fault for not <laughs> rhyming. Like you, Rob. Yeah, that's right. yeah. It's my fault for not rhyming. <laughs> Uh, Phil, uh, we've been hearing, we did hear a lot about supply chain problems. Have not heard that mentioned for the last several months. Has that been fixed, or you just got tired of talking about it? Well, before you answer that, Phil, I want to throw one thing out there. Last week, we heard the news that the Panama Canal may be operating on reduced schedules because of drought. The water levels aren't enough to support the ships going through. I didn't hear that. That's a, so that piece is news to me, but. The supply chain, while it's not back to what it was pre-COVID, I don't think anyway, it, it's healthy enough to not be a uh, such a big headwind like it was in 2021 when China was still not reopening. So the supply, the supply chain is is healthy enough not to be a problem at the moment, which is one of the, one of the reasons why inflation has come down to the point that it has. It's still high, you know. When we say hey, if inflation's come down, then you go to the grocery store. I went to get some batteries last night got the wrong batteries i went to get some batteries last night and walked out with 30 bucks because i saw some granola bars i thought i'd like i spent 30 <laughs> bucks and it, it is frustrating but the fact of the matter is inflation has come down just not to the point that we want and a healthy earth supply chain has helped that yeah going back to your point rob about the panama canal it's, it's the lake in the middle that's uh, getting low on drought i do not think that is going to impact availability it will impact the cost well the, well, the report said it would be it would reduce the number of ships going through. Yeah, that's going. I think that's going to be uh, the cost factor as far as availability. There's enough ports on the west coast I and the point. east coast that we could ensure availability. I have a question, but first I have a rant. I'm going to go back to the to the Federal Reserve. Is it not in first place? I, is it the Bill Gill and Phil thing <laughs> leaving Rob out? Is that your rant? I I think you're being overly kind to the Fed. Phil. I agree. I Many think do. Powell do declared think? war on the American economy. Well, uh, here, that, that overstates it, but here's, here's, uh, here's what concerns much. me, and it overarches everything that happened during the, the COVID debacle. They reacted out of fear, and <clears throat> they, were, they reacted out of fear that was driven by the lack of information. So what they did is overreact, which, okay, fine, you get a buy for that, but then when they doubled down on it and said – essentially lied and said, no, 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 this is just transitory. This isn't real inflation. It had to be real inflation. There was no other explanation of it. I think it was a political decision. It was timed that way to be a political decision. They were hiding for cover, and I, I lay it the, this mess entirely at their feet. A major conspiracy, was it? I wasn't a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a political act. I think that they made a mistake. They realized the mistake, and they couldn't back off of it. Because they would lose face and it was a political year, they'd be hanged by it if, if they did, if they confessed that we caused this inflation. So they tried to mask it and, and, and here well, we are. Well, they backed off the transitory. I mean, they've admitted that the transitory belief was, was a mistake and they were wrong. So that, they have admitted that. After the election. But it, at the, one of the – well, they're not elected. They're appointed. But the, the Federal Reserve's appointed. But the, the – the, in reality, though, what they're doing is unwinding what they did through COVID and, and to completely judge them. And, and, and I, I agree, and I've been accused of that by many, that I'm, I'm way too easy on, on the Fed, on the Federal Reserve for their actions. However, the game's not over yet. So if we do achieve a soft landing, let's just say that that happens. So we achieve a soft landing and we're sitting in 25 and 26 and rates are normalized. They're not going to be back down to where they were, I wouldn't think. But rates are normalized. We have a healthy job market, and we have a healthy stock market. Would they have done the right thing, even though they admit it? And, and I agree. They, they made a mistake, an error in judgment uh, with the transitory tone that they sent. Well, of course, I had to back off. They had no choice. But at the end of the day, if you say, hey, inflation never got above 9.1%, uh, our, our markets went into a, a – full uh, bear market in 2022, but it climbed out of it, and we kept a healthy, uh, somewhat healthy jobs market through the entirety of the whole ordeal, they would have then won. And even though that they, they messed up in the second quarter of the entire thing, they would have still won. So while I, I have been easy on them, I, I do reserve the right to back up and say, whoop, they missed it. If we have an extremely hard landing that throws, into, it throws us into a, a crazy recession, if inflation 
ticks back up to 9% like it did before, and they're unable to tame it. But to this point, I, I understood, and if we went back to in uh, April, May, and June, I understood because of the data that they're reading, the comparison of it, you're almost flying blind. And I got that and, and didn't think, I, I, I personally didn't think that it was, it was political. Um, and, and I believed, I was like, yeah, it's transitory. How can you compare? But what they had really, what they underestimated was how much money and the willingness of consumers to spend money once we were freed up from COVID. And a lot of it because of the easy money policy that they had, whether we obtained funds through home equity loans or refinancing our homes or uh, the unemployment benefits or, or whatever it was. Uh, overall, and we have, this is always a part of it that we forget, we didn't spend money. We didn't spend the money that we typically spent because we were home. We couldn't travel. We ate what we bought at the grocery store instead of letting things go to waste. You weren't buying work clothes. You weren't spending gas money. You saved your own money. So that what was really underestimated by everybody was the strength of the consumer coming out and their willingness to spend even at, because the main supporter of inflation has been the consumer, the main supporter of it. If the consumer said, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm not going to spend it, well, then that demand is gone. But that demand remained there because we were willing to do it. We complained about it, and we still kind of are. As a whole, not everyone, I'm not talking about each individual, but as a whole, our society complained about it but didn't stop doing it so that supported inflation and that's where i think everyone's biggest mistake was underestimating the strength of the consumer phil i'm a lot more supportive or sympathetic with the uh, uh the fed than what i think rob and john may be uh, rob, it, rob is hard on them bill yeah. it, it, it is he, I have war on the economy. american economy war nothing short of that but, but now, if they hadn't increased rates we might be looking at 14 15 percent he'd be saying the same thing i'd go oh, i'd okay. go get a cd phil. <laughs> okay but let me let, uh, that was my preface. I'm about to make my point now. It's awful difficult to judge success in isolation. Uh, how does the U? How has the U.S. performed relative to the other major countries in the world? Well, that's, and, that's, and I'm glad you asked that because that's another point where I would stand beside the Federal Reserve and say, "Good job," because we have come out of the COVID, whether it's loosening our economy and tightening everyone did some sort of the same thing and we're ahead of everyone else our inflation isn't as bad as most other developed uh, countries and in our job market and our employment market still looks much better which is why you see still you know i get it august september and in october what wasn't that bad but let's go back and let's judge our stock market and let's judge our, our economy on the day that everybody started getting sent, sent home for COVID, on the day we said, yes, we have to take this seriously. And this isn't just a, a, a new flu that's going around. This is something more that's going to do more to us. Let's judge it from that point and then see how, that we, how we've done. And I think if you go from start to finish, we've, we've been okay. It's been all right as far as our economy is concerned. And it is in, in better shape than most others. All right, Phil, I got a couple of football dates to throw your way this morning. <laughs> 1869 in New Brunswick, New Jersey, Rutgers College defeats the College of New Jersey, now known as Princeton University, 6-4 to four in the first official intercollegiate American football game. This date, 1869. 6-4, uh, yeah. Hey, uh, and, and by the way, it's not that one side scored a touchdown, the other two safeties. They scored it differently then, and the game looked nothing like it does. I don't know if you've seen the NCAA history of a college football series that was out a couple of years ago. It kind of covered this. It, it, it was more of like a mass scrum soccer kind of, you know, rugby football game than it was a traditional college football that you see now. But give them a break. It was in the early stages of college football. And it was on this date in 1995, and if there's any Cleveland Browns fans out there, you probably know what I'm going to tell you next. Art Modell moves the Browns to Baltimore, where they become the Ravens. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> Wish you wouldn't have given me, that, given me that date. What a good football weekend it was, though, right? Our Steelers are 5-3, and three, although this is, here's, a, here's a, a stat for you that I read last night while I was trying to fall asleep. Uh, this is the first time that a uh, team has been outgained in yards every single game, but still has a winning record. Yes, the Pittsburgh Steelers have not outgained a single team, but still has a winning record. So 
good for them. It's, it's not about who. It's not about the stat sheet. It's about the wins and losses. And as Bill Parcell said, you are what your record says you are. And our Steelers are five and three. And that whole division is five and three, by the way, Phil. It's the only division Except for the Ravens. Yep, yep. You know, seven and two. Division is yep, seven and two, and all five. And that's a tough division, man. That's it's tough. Uh, the only division in the NFL where everybody has a winning record. So, Phil, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at three zero four two six three four three four three, or stop by and see us with an appointment at twelve seventy Winchester Avenue, right here, in Martinsburg. Have a great day, Philip. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, guys.